Our next three panelists will be focusing on solutions. First up, speaking on the topic of the TPNW as the international mechanism to eliminate nuclear weapons is Beatrice Finn. Beatrice Finn is the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning campaign coalition that works to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. Ms. Finn has over a decade of experience in disarmament diplomacy and civil society mobilization through her work with ICANN, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the Geneva Center for Security Policy. She has written extensively on weapons law, humanitarian law, civil society engagement in diplomacy and multilateral institutions, and gender perspective on disarmament work. Beatrice, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here today. It's really, really nice to, to participate in this event. Um, I want to start by, you know, just a uh, uh, huge gratitude to Back from the Brink campaign and all the US partners of ICANN for putting this event together and also for organizing and keeping this conversation um, so active right now. And I think it's, it's a really important moment to have this conversation today. Um, and I want to start by, before going into the TPNW more specifically, I want to start by kind of highlighting why right now is such an important moment to, to raise this issue. And not just because of the, the issues that Sia and Michael raised about the risks of nuclear weapons use, but we've seen 500,000 Americans die from a pandemic. Um, I mean, the, the number is almost unimaginable to think about, 500,000 people. And we do know that climate change will have an even worse impact on American lives uh, and society in the coming decades. Uh, it will be a devastating impact. Um, there's been a huge sort of reckoning of racism this past years where people have uh, started to really kind of articulate and, and clarify how the institutions built to protect Americans are actually harming so many people. Um, and we have a, a huge sort of movement around gender equality that's starting to question the, the policies of sort of that are ingrained in toxic masculinity in terms of problem solving, this idea that we can threaten and bully people into submission. And of course, in the backdrop of this, an enormous economic injustice situation where uh, inequalities are growing. And we've seen that in the recent sort of COVID relief packages, how the weapons companies that want to make new nuclear weapons pretty much gets blank checks from taxpayer money. But the country cannot afford to pay a $15 minimum wage to the people that they claim to be essential workers to have kept our society alive and running throughout this pandemic, or gave $2,000 to American families that are struggling through this huge economic crisis. So I think that that's, you know, as a backdrop also, these are all issues that are extremely relevant when we talk about security and what protects us and how to look at nuclear weapons from those perspectives is, is extremely, I think there's a, um, there's a readiness from people to start linking nuclear weapons with these issues right now. And I think it's something that we need to take advantage of. So that, I think that's why it was such an, uh, a remarkable moment on 22nd of January, when the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force. Uh, a, a huge moment that was marked by celebration and commemoration around the world, uh, including loads of um, dozens of protests in the US at nuclear weapons laboratories, at bases, universities contributing to nuclear weapons. We saw a really huge turnout, uh, despite the very challenging kind of conditions for organizing right now through the pandemic. And the treaties entering into force was really a, a hugely significant moment for international law and peace and security. And sometimes these treaties um, don't seem particularly important in, in, in that moment when they appear, uh, but we can really see over the decades later what an enormous impact they have on shif shifting our world and shifting our behavior. Uh, and this treaty really follows on to such you know, crucial instruments as the UN Charter that regulates when you can use, uh, how you can use um, war uh, and the Geneva Conventions on how to protect civilians in conflicts, the 
biological weapons convention, the bans bioweapons, the ban on chemical weapons, the ban on landmines, and now also we have a treaty banning nuclear weapons. And it's really, it's going to be growing in importance over the next decades, this treaty. Uh, so while we, of course, want to see immediate impact, I think this is something that these kind of treaties and these instruments are, are tools that we can use to shift behavior and kind of shepherding countries into behaving in a certain way uh, in the future. And if the treaty really builds on activism, decades of activism and leadership of survivors and impact states to to eliminate nuclear weapons. So I just want to quickly run through a little bit of what the treaty includes. It really breaks new legal ground. It's the first comprehensive treaty that bans all activities related to nuclear weapons, and it provides a pathway for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, it has two specific parts that you know are very close to me, and I really you know think is is groundbreaking in terms of the that it requires assistance for victims of nuclear weapons use and testing and to rem remediate uh, impacted environments. And it also recognizes the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons that it has on women and girls, and of course also indigenous communities. And these kind of things are stuff that we can build on in the future and to make these links with the other, other issues that people are talking about. The treaty has the support of, you know, was adopted by over a majority of states in the world. And the number of signatures and states parties continues to grow. Uh, just last week, Comoros and Philippines became the latest states to ratify the treaty, being up to 54. And we know that many more are going to come in the future. And even in countries that don't yet support this treaty, we see really how polls shows that the public support these kind of instruments and supports the TPNW. Cities are not happy being targets of nuclear weapons. Uh, and support the treaty and wants that to wants the treaty to be the, the government to join the treaty and also many parliamentarians uh, and political representatives in countries are starting to support this treaty actually 64 percent of americans according to a recent poll supports joining the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and the treaty will really have an impact even if the united states have not yet signed it uh, the implementation of the TPNW by the state's parties will make a difference. For example, on the victim assistance and environmental remediation provisions, which can create new international standards for addressing nuclear weapons humanitarian harm and really have a concrete impact on the communities that have been impacted by these weapons. Um, and of course, further research on implementing verification articles can help advance knowledge and progress on how to verify nuclear disarmament. And all states parties in this treaty are really are now legally bound to get more countries to join the treaty and to promote the universalization of the treaty, meaning that these 54 states that are now states parties will work as a group to mobilize and bring in more countries and kind of build a new norm around this treaty. And of course, also we've seen in the past for other treaties that um, the, there's a normative power of, of international law that also kind of impacts the states outside the treaty. For example, past weapons prohibitions have shown that even states that are not parties, they start to modify and change their behavior to comply and move towards this new international treaty. We've seen that with the mine ban treaty, with the chemical weapons convention, with the biological weapons convention and cluster munitions conventions. For example, we have seen with the landmines and cluster munitions that companies producing the banned weapons, even in countries that have not joined the treaty, stopped. Uh, countries change policy on use and transfers and financial institutions start divesting from producing companies. So for the TPNW and the United States, um, the US of course has not joined the TPNW yet, but it will start feeling the impact of this treaty as it has done with other weapons prohibitions it has not yet joined. Uh, pressure is growing in the United States to join the treaty with civil society organizations calling for it, cities joining the I Can Cities Appeal and the Back from the Brink initiatives. Um, the opinion, you know, public conversations, public pressure, Congress supports and public opinion are starting to grow in favor of this. And the Biden administration right now has the opportunity to reverse previous administrations kind of ineffective and unhelpful approach to the treaty. Uh, and of course, first and foremost, the Biden administration should stand on the right side of the history and sign the TPNW and submit it to the Senate for the ratification. But of course, also in the meantime, it should really take steps 
when it comes to come into compliance with the treaty, uh, to set this new standard in international law, including stopping the production of any new nuclear weapons and negotiate further cuts on worldwide nuclear arsenals. The US government ha now has an opportunity to really look at this treaty as a helpful contribution, as a tool that can be used to get the world closer to nuclear disarmament. We know that it will take time. We've had 75 years with nuclear weapons. It's going to take time to reverse course, but the treaty can be this really helpful tool to start shifting perceptions and start moving away from nuclear weapons towards a, a different type of, of security scenario. So this is really, you know, a very exciting time and a, a really crucial time. The risk of nuclear weapons use is increasing, but we're also seeing huge public mobilization to challenge these sort of established uh, methods of, of, of carrying out national security. So this is really the right moment to get engaged and to get involved and start growing awareness uh, around this issue and what needs to be done. Um, so I'm really excited also to, to see these workshops where I think we're going to go into details on really how regular people can contribute to this issue. I think sometimes it feels really overwhelming to people to feel, to know what can I do to this issue. So I would really encourage everyone who's here today to join the workshops, to talk about specific ways of, and to hear it on the specific initiatives and ways where people can get involved and, and really change this issue and change the world. So thank you very much.